Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Marie Vigourou. And I'm Drew Shulman. In this episode, we're diving into Supernatural Season 8, Episode 5, Blood Brother. Let's get this show on the road. I feel like we have to start off even before the housekeeping just by stating how unhinged the energy is today <laughs> and most of that is my fault <laughs> i'm bringing the like i need those little like flags you see someone waving around like just woo benny <laughs> yeah that's true between editing and talking about these episodes and doing live watches like it's a clear shift from last week to this week my affection for benny we all knew you were going to love him. That's why I was so surprised in episode one when you were like, oh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. <laughs> At first, he was just like the home wrecker. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, you have to forget that I know that Cass returns. So I have chosen to believe from this moment forward, Cass does return sometime at the end of season 15. Anything before that, I have no knowledge of. So I don't know. Maybe he's back next week. Maybe he's back in six more seasons. You got to get on that multi-ship. Multi-shipping is a thing? Yes, absolutely it is. I've never been in a fandom where multiple shippings, like you could be a fan of multiple shippings and not feel like you were like d betraying a different one. It's a thing in all of fandoms, by the way, just saying like, oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> We do have a little bit of housekeeping, and it is a reminder that I am going to be at New Jersey Con from May 17th to 19th. And so, as we've been saying for the past few weeks, we're not going to have a booth, so we're not going to be selling on-site. You know, that wasn't the goal of the trip. However, if you buy in advance off of our Etsy store, it would be my pleasure to deliver it to you at New Jersey Con. If you want a pin, if you want a print, if you want a tote, or if you want all three, you won't have to pay shipping fees. There's an option for a local pickup. You can go read our post about that at carryingwayward.com. The jealousy knows no bounds. I want everyone to go see you and have fun. And I want you to have a great time and people to get some merch local. They don't have to worry about shipping. And I'll just be home thinking about you. <laughs> I'll just wait here then. This week, patrons and coffee supporters got to hear us answer the question, who or what was your childhood pet named after? on the supporter-exclusive Impala Talk feed. You can go to carryingwayward.com to support us and claim your perks. So I know that you talked about it very briefly at the beginning, but I kind of want to know how you feel about Dean and Benny and Dean slash Benny. Oh my lord, I love the Southern Vampire. Jesus, give me more of him. Although you're appealing to the wrong deity, but whatever. <laughs> oh, Alpha Vamp, give me more. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Much better deity. I genuinely, after this episode, like, I see the Dean Benny thing. I see that connection. I see that relationship. I feel like I'm now at the point where I want more of it because I want to see it develop. I want to see how they interact. There's kind of a level of, like, there's a surface levelness to it where, like, they haven't been able to, like, reach deeper down to communicate. I feel like it's there. We just haven't seen enough of it yet. So now that we've talked about this, how about you get us a recap? Three, two, one, vampires. <laughs> I can't believe no one thought of that first. We start with Benny, and he's encountering some old vampire, air quote, friends of his, and they're all like, whoa, you shouldn't be back. We better get into a big fight and leave you nearly for dead. And then he'll call Dean, and Dean's like, I'm going to be super shady about this and not let Sam know that I'm going to go see a friend, in the biggest air quotes I could physically do, to swoop in to save his new boyfriend. They go after this vampire nest together. We learn about Benny's backstory and falling in love and then being betrayed and double betrayed, it turns out. Ultimately, he does kill all of his vampire family and old father slash god, but lets Dean finish off his girlfriend, which I think is very metaphorical in a weird way. But then ultimately, they escape. They're good. They're supposed to go their separate ways, but then Sam who's been like freaking out this whole time where Dean is, shows up and shakes Benny's hand and the realization dawns on all three of their faces in very different ways and it is the best ending to an episode. Time. 
This episode was written by none other than Ben Edlund, directed by Guy B, and it originally aired on October 31st, 2012. I never look at the writer and director until we get to this point. And then, like, as soon as you said Ben Edlund, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. To be clear from the get-go, this episode is absolutely unhinged. (laughs) And I plan on being just as unhinged as Mr. Ben Edlund was when he wrote this. For context for this episode, I would like to draw from two previous episodes. 203 Bloodlust, which is the episode where we meet Lenore, the good vampire played by Ember Benson, and Gordon, who we remember is played by Oscar nominee Sterling K. Brown. In that episode, I want to remind you, Drew, and everybody who's listening, that Sam was very okay with letting Lenore and her nest live, And it was Dean who had to be convinced otherwise. This is also the episode where vampires are referred to as fangs, which we had linked to the reclaimed slur fag. The second episode that comes to mind as I was watching this was 414 Sex and Violence, the siren episode, where Dean's siren is a hunky, good-looking dude played by Jim Perrick, who, hear me out, doesn't look unsimilar to Benny. This episode starts by reminding us that Kevin is in hiding from Sam and Dean because Dean tried to kill his mom. And the thing that I love about this is that the tone is completely different from two weeks ago, right? Like, it's almost like we're seeing a different point of view on that, like a different opinion from a different writer as well. It's a very nice way to kind of set the stage, keep us in the overarching story that I gather we'll be getting back to, given that I know Kevin does return. This is the second time, and not the last, that Dean is going to make up a name for a monster. We had the Jefferson Starships in 619 Mommy Dearest, and in this episode we have the Vampirates, which, by the way, I think we really need to take a second to acknowledge the compounded queerness of this. Like, you might as well make them cowboys on top of it, you know? And then you've got the trifecta of gay. I was gonna say, I feel like that's putting a hat on a hat, but it would be a little cowboy hat. Exactly. And as soon as he called them vampirates, I was like, it was funny because I was like waiting for the punchline of like Benny being like, no, of course we thought of that, you idiot. Like, that's the dumbest joke you could make. But he legitimately seemed like, kind of like, oh, that's adorable. I love that. That's because he loves him. When someone you love makes a dumb joke, you just smile and nod and thank them for it. And you say, oh, you're lucky you're pretty. We again see more of the love triangle between Dean, Benny, and Cass, with Benny and Cass arguing in purgatory. I also want to highlight that line that Benny says in the Impala, my life changed when she entered it. He's basically saying that Andrea changed him, and if you know, you know. And finally, I want to point out the line, we are real, Benny. This is real. You know, if ever Dean is wondering what's real in his life, he can take comfort in the fact that him and Benny were real. My God, does Benny do a really good job of making me love him this week? And not just the sexy and the accent. Those are just bonuses. I just meet his actions as well. He is incredibly loyal. This week, our theme is bonding. Bonding comes from the word bound, which is a noun, which is actually a 13th century Old English word that has the same root as band and bind. And at the time, it meant like anything that binds, that fastens or confines, which is really fascinating in an episode called Blood Brother, if you ask me. Like the word bonding itself originally referred to a method of laying bricks or stones. So again, like there's this idea of permanence, this idea of like confinement, dare I say, commitment. Dare you indeed. I dare. Shall we speak of Sam? I do want to point out that in the flashbacks, the way that Sam is coping with everything is by fixing things, right? Um, Starting with Riot the dog, then with the AC unit, and then he ends up getting a job as a maintenance person at the motel. And I'm pointing this out because we've seen Dean do a lot of this in the past. But this is Sam doing it now. And there was a mention a few episodes ago of like him fixing the Impala too. And I guess that what I'm reading into this is that even though like in Sam's mind, Dean is gone or dead, um, he's doing things that he could bond over with Dean, right? So like it's his way of connecting to the memory of Dean, of keeping his memory alive. 
Like, especially the idea of taking care of the car. Like, that was the one that really made, like, the, like connected the boats with me. That it wasn't just, like, away in storage. That it was something he was really still connected to. I think this is how Sam is dealing with the idea of not hunting anymore. Uh, we know that Sam's, you know, hunting was very much thrust upon him and really stayed, you know, out of a familial commitment and the drive to help others. So if he can continue to do the helping part through a much less supernatural or life-threatening means, uh, but continue to exist in a space of making everyone feel better, then it makes perfect sense. Plus, given the family trend of fixing the Impala and that kind of being where I would assume Sam learned most of his handy skills from, it makes sense that it would be like the thing he would grab onto as a way of connecting with other humans and continuing to find a use for himself. Yeah, he's moving from like saving people hunting things to like helping people. And on a hot day, my AC being fixed, I would take that over getting rid of a ghost. We also see some bonding between Sam and Amelia, although this episode doesn't really start off that way, right? Like we see Amelia being scared of Sam when she finds him in her in her room, and it comes out as verbal aggression. And again, I need to stress that Sam can be a really scary dude for someone who doesn't know him, right? Like, it becomes a talking point even at the end there when she says, like, it's creepy you buy all your clothes at army surplus. White supremacists do that. Drifting serial killers do that. You come from nowhere, you appear to be going nowhere, and you've, quote, seen a lot of stitches. It's all pretty solid creepy. So again, like, if I'm putting myself in her shoes, I totally get that she's not immediately like warm and fuzzy with him and that she's actually standing up for herself and trying to keep herself safe from this very large drifter man who is in her motel room without her consent, right? It's so set up for like that moment. It's just because I hear a lot of people say like, she's so mean to him. And I'm like, dude, I would be mean to him too. Like if I walked into my apartment and some dude was in there, I would be screaming my head off. Like <laughs> I would not be nice. The fact that she didn't, like, hit him over the head with something immediately is, like, shocking to me. I think we as an audience can separate ourselves from the show's every man or every woman, like Amelia, who sees Sam not as a hero. Because, again, we have a perception of Sam that not everyone does. Um, you know, he, he, to us, is this rugged savior. But to anyone else, he would appear as a moose in your apartment. You know, a man with a weird past and creepy tendencies. Even if we know he's a nice guy, we've had eight seasons over several years to learn this. Amelia has not. You know, Sam in her hotel room, unannounced, working on some pipes, also feels very much like one of those, like, fake premises. Like, oh, I'm in your place and I'm supposed to be here. Like, really, are you? Like, I don't know this. The hotel didn't tell me. And it just, it, it gives off very, like, fake, weird vibes. Like, I could see this being the kind of thing Sam would do to, like, sneak into a place if he was looking for a ghost or a demon. But then uh, there is some bonding happening between them, or at least, like, the glimmer of bonding when Sam basically says out loud that Amelia is just like him. She has no idea where she's going, and she has no one just like him. So we're seeing some some kind of, of bonding, and I would argue that it's mostly trauma bonding that we're seeing between these two. Trauma bonding is definitely the key word in this, like, early, early amount of info we get for them. It's okay. We've all been there. It happens. <laughs> I feel as if this bonding in this moment is designed to make understanding Sam easier for Amelia or the viewer. It's a reminder that people are layered and everyone has their past, their secrets and plans or lack thereof in some people's cases. And just because Amelia isn't a hunter with... A troubled demon-filled past doesn't mean she doesn't have her own shit to deal with and her own expectations of the world. So despite the differences, and as far as I know, there are plenty of differences between these two people, they can still bond over the fact that they are both just humans dealing with their own stuff. I mean, grief is grief. Yeah. It can take a lot of different shapes, a lot of different sizes, um, a lot of different expressions, but grief is grief. And I think in this particular case, like they're seeing each other's grief, right? So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I mean, we know where it goes, but there you go. Uh, before we move on to Dean, I do want to come back to like the troubled relationship between Sam and Dean in this episode. In the very brief moments where they interact, as sassy as Sam is being with Amelia, he's even more sassy with Dean. The lines, what guy? Garth? 
And also, a friend? Dean, you don't have any. All your friends are dead. (laughs) Both of these lines really come to mind when I'm thinking about this, which again, like, Sam, like, a little bit of, like, tact, I guess? Both of these lines are said with the same intensity as the, like, what? From the Metatron conversation, which I'm sure everybody knows that I loved, both in that episode and now, so peak comedy for me. Anyway, so we're seeing Sam being, like, both incredibly sassy with Dean, almost mean, really, and we're also seeing him be, like, incredibly worried about Dean. And... When I was thinking about this, it was like, oh my god, this feels so familiar. And it's Amelia. His fear of losing Dean is coming out as verbal aggression. And I mean, like, I think this goes to show the very deep brotherly bond that they share. We're seeing Sam's frustration here. Like, he's kind of been getting shit from Dean all season so far. And has, for the most part, been very open and honest, despite how it makes him look in Dean's eyes. And despite this honesty and vulnerability Dean has been super cagey and like suddenly drops this I have a friend revelation on him like can you blame Sam like he knows his brother he assumes better than anyone and suddenly you know Mr. Can't Keep a Friend has a new best buddy that needs saving that Sam's never heard about despite Dean's last year in purgatory it's a red flag it comes across very sassy but I think it is very much trying to be like, do you understand why I'm coming at you like this? Why I'm so like, what's going on? Because even without the year in purgatory thing, that's like a big red flag for Dean to have some weird secret friend. The whole thing is that like, the way that it comes out is verbal aggression. Like, you know, you don't have any friends. Like all your friends are dead. Like (laughs) not very nice things to say, kind of mean things to say, which is a little bit like what Amelia had done to him, right? And so that fear comes out as aggression. And so we're seeing like how much Sam is afraid for Dean, but also like maybe that Sam took a few things from Amelia on the way. All of this is also making me wonder if Sam could really be able to walk away from Dean and hunting. Because like, This is Dean hunting alone. And at that thought, Sam is so taken with fear that he steals a car and drives to him. Like, could Sam really stand the thought of being entirely alone again, knowing that he's not around to save Dean? I don't know. Much like his fixing things, this kind of saying one thing but meaning another is feeling very Dean-like to me. I think the relief of Dean being gone was a huge weight off Sam's soul. And I think the only way Sam retires is closing the gates of hell 100% and knowing that there's no need to worry about Dean or if Dean isn't around again. And I don't like that as an option. When when your retirement plan is either literally save the world or my brother dies. Well, that's the thing, right? Because Sam is all like, oh, I want to I wanna go back to school. I want to stop hunting. I want to do this. I want to do that. And Dean was like, No, you don't. But I think this is exactly it, right? Like, as quote-unquote mean as Dean was when he said that, I don't think he was wrong. I don't think Sam really wants to to stop hunting because look at him. Look at what's going on here. Sam does want to stop hunting, but there's no way to stop hunting if Dean is still hunting. I think if you want to do something, you do it. And so if you would rather one thing than another, then you want the other thing more than the one, you know? But I think the ranking of hunting, stop hunting, but then above both those is being there for my brother, making sure he's safe and well. That's what I'm saying. That's his priority. That's what he wants the most. As soon as that's not in the picture anymore, i.e. the gates of hell are 100% closed and there's no more demons or bad things ever, or Dean isn't around to be the thing that needs to be helped and saved, he's able to go back to not hunting like he was for the past year. I also would like to talk about Sam's reaction to Benny. (laughs) I think it is just so good how we get like a little shot of each of them in this moment and like a lingering handshake and just like you can see in each of their faces. Dean's like, oh God, please let this go well. Like just like the noticing Sam reaching for, I can tell if it was a knife or a gun in the moment, but like just like the, no, we're not doing that. We're not attacking this one. He's a good one. And just like, Okay, you've met, you didn't kill each other, this is a great start. Benny is just like, 
oozing with like he's loving this moment. He is in such a happy place of being like, I get to meet a hunter who really wants me dead. And he can't kill me because I love his boyfriend. And his boyfriend loves me. My brother <laughs> loves me. I just, oh my God. It's amazing. Again, the acting of being able to like, there's very little expression, but there's the right amount to make that very clear. And then Sam, like you can hear the gears grinding in his brain as he's like, this is the friend. The friend is a vampire. They must have met in per Like, he's doing the math and everything comes up as, oh, fuck this. I love Benny's little, well, I guess you guys have a lot to talk about. <laughs> this, again, has a very similar vibe to things he said in Purgatory between Cass and Dean to, like, kind of spark the fuse and run away. He's just a shit disturber. I disagree with that. I don't think he's a shit disturber, but I do think he likes to have things, like, laid out on the table. You know, he's like, I would rather things be said than unsaid. And that is so unlike Dean in all of his relationships that it feels like shit disturbing. But Benny is just like this open, like heart, on, heart, heart on his sleeve kind of dude. And I think that like, that's also partly why it feels so different for Dean to be in this relationship with him. There's still like a little bit of like that sly evil, like, oh, I like, oh, this is fun for me a little bit in Benny. But you're right, it, Benny does have this tendency to be a lot more cut and dry and honest and like kind of a no shit kind of guy, which is interesting because that reminds me, and I know we're getting to Dean after this, but it kind of makes me think about how Dean, you know, dealing with Cass after Cass got out of the mental health clinic. It's what he was like reaching for, right? Like it's what he was trying to implement and to, to, to oh, interesting. He wanted things just laid out on the table yeah. and like the conversation to be honest in there. The thing that Benny is doing. He wanted things to be simple, clear, and pure. Hmm, interesting. On that change of note, would you like to talk to us about Dean? So from Dean's point of view, Sam is being a bit of a ball buster this week. <laughs> He's asking questions that Dean doesn't want to answer. And to be fair, they're all very fair questions. I don't want to make this into a Team Dean or Team Sam, but like honestly, I feel like those are fair questions. I won't argue with Dean here. I think the I need a day off to deal with some personal shit, no matter how many questions it may raise. And as I said before, on Sam's behalf, yeah, they're valid questions. I think letting him go and letting Dean have, you know, this should not be that hard. Like, no matter how close you are with someone, it's okay for them to have a life outside of you. And I think Sam feels it a bit, like, it feels as a bit of a betrayal in that he got shit for having a life outside of Dean, and now Dean is supposed to have a life outside of Sam, and it's supposed to be fine. That I can definitely see, and I agree with you that Sam is resentful of that. However, Sam is right. Like, <laughs> he has no friends. Who the fuck is he talking to? Why is he being so shady about it? Of course it's a fair request, but you're also not playing by the rules that you want to have established, right? Like, Dean wants Sam to tell him everything about the girl, right? Like, and he wants to know why he stopped hunting and, like, what? Like, he's demanding a lot of answers, and yet here he's unable to give, or unwilling, let's be honest, unwilling to give any, right? And I'm like, Dean, I see that you're angry. I see your anger. But there are better ways to express it than to act this way, than to behave in that way. Both have very valid points. Like... But both are mad about something. And it's like, you're both right. You're both being little bitches, but you're both right. <laughs> I understand your point about this. And I understand your point about that. But guys, stop throwing it in each other's faces, you know? <laughs> like Seriously. So again, much like this episode explores Sam's bond with Amelia, it also explores Dean's bond with Benny. And oh my god, this episode is so gay. I again got some like Sam Ruby flashbacks when Dean took Benny's call outside of the motel room and Sam was like watching from the window like the creepy guy that he is, you know? <laughs> like Amelia was right. All I'm gonna say, Amelia was right. Hell yeah. Then there's also this idea that Dean and Benny's relationship is like forbidden. You know, it's wrong. It's bad. Sam wouldn't approve if he found out. Uh, people wouldn't understand. And this is why like to me, the relationship this bond anyway, like goes way beyond like the brothers at arms trope because brothers at arms don't feel like they're doing something wrong when they call each other or when they want to meet up. Right. Like 
I do see the brothers at arms trope. I think it goes beyond that. And I think that that's undeniable. Like this relationship between these two men is told the way that queer stories are told. And we just had an episode last week talking about how important it is to understand different styles of storytelling to be able to really understand the story at hand. Let's put that to use and understand and contextualize Dean and Benny's also quite profound bond. Let's talk about this bond from Sam's point of view for a second, because like, of fucking course Sam wouldn't approve of this. Dean has been the poster child of Monster is Monster, and here he has found one that he can trust and is beginning to soften up and is growing comfortable with, and while he knows how it will make him look to Sam, I mean... If we're drawing parallels, this is literally a queer experience, having a partner who is out and being too nervous to introduce them to your people because it means that you have to come out suddenly. And I think the brothers in arms trope here is used to cover up the start of a relationship. It's Dean's way of saying, like, we're we're just brothers in arms. That's all this is. When deep down he knows it's not what it is. And Benny's like, yeah, you know what this is. The balance between brothers at arms and lovers really reminded me of 415 Sex and Violence our beloved Siren episode. Because in that episode, the Siren tells Sam, I gave him what he needed, and it wasn't some bitch in a G-string, it was you, a little brother that looked up to him that he could trust. And now he loves me. He'd do anything for me. And I gotta tell you, Sam, that kind of devotion, I mean, watching someone kill for you, it's the best feeling in the world. And this makes me want to scream, because who is Benny if not a brother at arms and a lover to Dean, literally watching him kill for him? Like, that is the exact bond that Dean has been craving this entire time, and the, like, the kind of like unwavering loyalty that he needed, and he hasn't really gotten from Cass so far. Like, Benny is Dean's dream guy, literally. God, if this fucking episode hasn't made me a Denny stan, oh! is that the term? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think my issue, at least with accepting Benny, has been my love for Cass. And like we've talked about in this episode already, I have prepared to understand multi-shipping and moving on in other relationships. And I think Cass meets Dean on a level of emotion and Benny on a level of action. Not to say there isn't emotion. It's Benny's ways of showing those emotions through action and through means oh that's interesting yeah well his actions speak louder than his words i guess he is a very like let's lay everything out on the table kind of guy also so like there is an emotionality to that there is like a loyalty to that too right to show that you are not betraying somebody by being honest with them everything we see him do when he is or isn't with dean are him making it very clear that what he has said the things he has told dean are factual, are truth, and he's sticking to his his guns. And, like, if we think even about the title of the episode, like, Sex and Violence, right? Like, it's in the title, Sex and Violence. Like, that is their relationship, like, lovers and brothers at arms. And this is even represented, I think, in, in Benny's lines, like, about the fangs and the fun. I mean, like, the fangs I get, but the fun, sir, this is a Wendy's, like... What do you mean the fun? Like, I know what I'm thinking when you say the fun, but like, is that what you mean too? Because that's a lot. That's a lot. So I'm going to focus on one last thing that I really want to look at. And that is like, what Dean and Benny are bonding over, like beyond sex and violence, of course, or the fangs and the fun, uh, I guess. And that's them talking about their respective fathers. There's a moment in the episode where Benny is talking about his maker. He says, our father, he was a jealous God. He kept his family together, but kept us apart from the rest of the world, always at sea. And like, how many times have we talked about John isolating Sam and Dean from everyone else on this show? Like, how relatable was that to Dean? And also like, how relatable would it have been to Cass? Also, like Dean has a type. Dean is bonding with Benny over their trauma relating to their father figures, just like Sam is bonding over his trauma with Amelia. I was so wrapped up in the sudden love for Benny that I somehow completely missed these incredibly powerful and, like, bluntly obvious connections. I'm not kidding. This is my first time thinking about it as I'm writing these notes and discussing it with you. Dean, and Cass too, Benny has issues with Dad, and it has molded him in a certain way and bled into his ability to connect with others. 
and how he shows his emotions and bonds with others. If this is not Dean's M.O. and clearly Dean's type, I don't know what else is. So originally when I sat down to write something for this critical time segment, I was going to write about the brothers at arms trope and how it relates to queer tropes. And I started doing some research and seeing what had been written about this, and I found something a little different, but really truly beyond my wildest dreams. I found a paper from 2013 written by Rosalie Dianica Fanchel called Beyond Blood Brothers, Queer Bruce Springsteen. And this is an academic article published by Cambridge University Press in a peer-reviewed journal called Popular Music. And to be clear, the paper doesn't really try to label Bruce Springsteen himself for his sexuality. That's something that only he can do. But it really points out some of the queerness of the lyrics and the queer aesthetics used at his concerts and on his album covers. And this was really eye-opening for me because, I mean, like, first off, I was never really into, like, the kind of rock that Springsteen plays. And the people that I knew who were really into Bruce Springsteen were, like, not really the kind of people that I wanted to be friends with. Like, it was mostly dudes who subscribed to, like, a very narrow and oppressive idea of masculinity. And so to read about the queerness in his songs, I was like, oh my god, this is just like the character of Dean Winchester. For some reason, like, both Springsteen's songs and Dean's character live in the social imagination as these, like, bastions of quote-unquote traditional masculinity, and yet queer people have been picking up on their queerness for decades. So that's point number one about this. Point number two is in the title of this episode, Blood Brother, and... We know that, especially in seasons like one to five, which the show is really trying to channel or at least like connect back to this season, so many episode titles were actually titles of rock songs. So guess who has a song called Blood Brothers? You would be correct if you said Bruce Springsteen. Now, there's a whole rabbit hole that you could go down if you start looking at that, but I'll stick to the song lyrics. And I'd like to read some of those lyrics, actually. Now I don't know how I feel, I don't know how I feel tonight, if I've fallen neath the wheel, if I've lost or if I've gained sight. I don't know why, I don't know why I made this call, or if any of this matters anymore after all. But the stars are burning, bright like some mystery uncovered, I keep moving through the dark, with you in my heart, my blood brother. Now, I think that some people might be a little skeptical that Blood Brother might refer to a same-sex romantic partner, but let me read to you some lyrics from another one of Springsteen's songs called No Surrender. Because we made a promise, we swore we'd always remember, no retreat baby, no surrender. Blood Brother is in the stormy night with a vow to defend, no retreat baby, no surrender. So here the narrator speaks to somebody that they call Baby. Uh, says that they have a vow to defend, and it turns out that the narrator refers to themselves and the person that they call Baby as Blood Brothers. And there's more. So the original version of this song goes like so. I want to sleep beneath the peaceful skies in my lover's bed with a wide open country in my eyes and these romantic dreams in my head. So this is the same song where we're talking about bl Blood Brothers and Baby and a vow to defend. And... In the live 1975-85 version of this song that was re-released, like, way after, he changed the lyrics to We could sleep in the twilight by the riverside with a wide-open country in our hearts and these romantic dreams in our heads. I need to stop because uh, otherwise, again, I would be here all day. Ben Edlund knew what he was doing, is all I'm going to say. I hope that now people understand why when Dean calls Benny brother it lands the way that it does for me. I'm already picturing the music video set to these songs of Dean and Benny. Like, with just this one episode, it's not hard, and I'm sure there's more to come. This week, we have a message from Sheer. Before we listen to it, we want to remind you to send us a three-minute voicemail. To respond to anything we discussed today or to ask us a question, you can use the recording app on your phone and email us the recording at carryingwayward at gmail.com. Hi, Marie and Drew. How are you? This is Sheer again. Um, ever since I realized we can send you guys messages 
regarding our thoughts about supernatural i just can't help myself but sending lots because i love talking about supernatural and i do not have many friends back home where i can discuss those things with so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you I wanted to talk about Sam, not only because I'm a huge Sam girl and Sam apologist. It's something that Marie said in Swan Song about his final act and that he finally regained control over his decisions and his body. And it just, it was so accurate in my mind and it just, it, it blew my mind. And then just the following episode, it all came back to him not controlling over what he's doing ever since he became Solar Sam. Uh, and he did things that the real Sam would never do ever ever and 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 it just it breaks my heart it brings me back to a line that Lucifer said in free to be you and me my heart breaks for you Sam and it, it really does it, it, it's weird that Lucifer said it and it's the line that I most relate to what's happening with Sam another thing that breaks my heart about him is that in free to be you and me I remember Dean telling Cass that it's like the best night he's had in a long time that he's having a lot of fun with him which just makes me think okay oh, so he's not having fun with Sam and then now I only just finished listening to um, you can't handle the truth where Bobby says that Dean is his favorite and I just wonder who's Sam favorite obviously except well he's my favorite obvious but except that <laughs> And it just got me thinking about the relationships that Sam has throughout these seasons. I mean, even up to season 10, he doesn't really have any meaningful relationships that are lasting other than Dean's. Even in future episodes, without giving too much away, when we do meet friends, new friends, new hunters, new someones, they're always closer to Dean they're the one that has relationships with him. I'm not even talking about Cass and the fact that, I don't know, maybe he doesn't even like Sam. <laughs> but a lot of episodes are ending with Dean talking to the whatever person they met and having like a, a nice bond with them. And Sam's walking away, letting them have their own moments. And who does Sam have moments with? It just, it appears to me that he is so alone. Like the only meaningful lasting relationship he had was with Ruby. <laughs> And now he's not even Bobby's favorite, so I don't know. And it brings me back to the question that his teacher asked him in After School Special. Are you happy? And I don't know. Is Sam happy? Sheer, I love this message, but what a sad ending. Poor Sam. I think we've touched on this a little bit before. I think there is a level of, like, the show knows Dean better, so they write Dean better. So, like, when they need to have, like, Dean, like that like last minute connection with the person to say goodbye. Like it just Dean fits that slot better. Sometimes I can think of like a few where Sam gets like the final goodbye or sometimes it's like a kiss or whatever, but like, you're right. Like the show doesn't give Sam much. And like, it really is sad. that he doesn't really have as many people. Like we talked about today, how he like, you know, pokes fun at Dean for having no friends. All of your friends are dead. Where are your friends, Sam? Who do you have besides Dean? You know, pot calling kettle black here. Um, yeah, and I, I genuinely like it. It's very heartwarming and sad to think about poor Sam with no one. And of course, we're in an era now where we know about Amelia. And it seems as soon as Dean isn't in the picture, Sam's able to connect with people and hold relationships. I'm not pointing fingers or saying anything. I'm just making an observation. Uh, but I do hope Sam gets some more people that like him because. I'm still in the camp that Cass doesn't like Sam. I, th I think Cass tolerates Sam. I don't think he likes him. <laughs> like a cat. He tolerates him. You know? like, <laughs> yes. Like cats tolerate us. He's he's very much that like that cat meme we're seeing now of the spare human. Oh. <laughs> Sam is the spare <laughs> human in this relationship. I didn't mean to make that sad. You made it sadder. <laughs> <laughs> Shira, thank you so much for this for this reflection. I agree with you, to be entirely honest. Like, I find that Sam's story is, is a tragedy. Not that Dean's isn't, but I think Sam's story in particular, because we're, we're not seeing him form meaningful relationships with others, the way that we do with Dean is even more of a tragedy. I like to comfort myself by thinking that 
what we see on screen isn't necessarily all that's happening. I like to comfort myself by telling myself that they have a life like outside of what we see in these episodes and that Tim has friends, <laughs> you know, like Sam does connect. Maybe he's the one actually who reaches out to people usually like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? And that's one way that I, I take comfort in this because truly, and I think a lot of the reason why here is is a writing issue, not necessarily like a Sam issue. And that's also something that's comforting to me. I'm like, when I write Sam, he is loved, right? Sam is loved in a lot of stories that I've read. Thank you for this reflection. Do you have any reflection on Call to Action this week? Despite being a first time watcher, my viewing is slightly skewed by the fact that I know things I would not have had I been watching this show live week to week as far as I know. Benny is not in the finale, but Cass is. I have to both remember for this show's sake to treat the knowledge as separate as best I can and to be objective, but also to not let like opinions or things that I don't have confirmation of that I've just heard around the internet affect my viewing and my ability to enjoy this show as a whole. I'm still doing this to enjoy the show and I'm enjoying it so far and I want to keep enjoying it. I was really compelled by this idea that the characters in this episode, like whether they're the ones that like we know very well or the ones that we're still getting to know, they don't actually really realize what they're bonding over. Like they realize that they have stuff in common and they see that and they feel seen by the other, but they don't realize that they're bonding over their wounds. I've done that, right? Like, and I see the value in it. But I think that in a romantic partnership, it's really important for that not to be the only thing you bond over, right? Like, this is really making me feel called to bond with people over hopes and dreams and life projects rather than only wounds and scars. This was Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Drew Shulman and Marie Vigourou. Thank you to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon, especially our Bunker supporters, Elle, Jeremiah Thomas, and Simone. We'd also like to thank Jake Lyon Hart for our music and Jacqueline Tucci for additional sound editing. Head over to carryingwayward.com to become a patron or a coffee subscriber and for our merch store and our socials. And write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Carry on, our wayward friends.